So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session devoted to the IUPAP winner talk. Um, we'll have then the opportunity to learn more about the uh, work that uh, the three recipients of these uh, awards have done recently. And in sequence, as you see, we will have a first talk by uh, Vincent Tassion. It's a recorded talk. So if you have questions, I suggest you email them to him, but he won't be live behind his computer. So it's just going to be a recorded uh, talk. And then we will uh, follow by uh, Chiara Safirio, who's there, and then uh, Stefanos Aretakis, who's there too. And I think I have the green light. So let's uh, start with uh, Vincent Tassion's talk for 25 minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the organizers, the committee, and uh, everyone involved for the prize, uh, as well as the, the chance to talk today. I'm re really sorry that I uh, cannot be uh, present in space and time, but uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about uh, percolation. Uh, so, before discussing the specific content of my talk, I would like to start with a few introductory words about the topic, which is percolation theory. Historically, uh, percolation theory was introduced as a mathematical framework aiming at describing the propagation of a fluid in a random medium. For example, in geology, how does water flow in, uh, how does water flow in rocks, or in ecology, how do fires propagate in forests? In both cases, we observe a phase transition phenomenon. If one plunges a rock in water, either the water stays at the surface of the rock or the rock is porous enough and the water can traverse and uh, propagate inside the rock. Uh, for forests, either the forest is sparse and a fire will uh, stay on a few trees or the forest in dense, and uh, a fire would propagate from one tree to the whole forest. The most famous percolation uh, model was introduced in the 50s by Broadband and Amherst. Uh, it's called uh, Bernoulli percolation because it's just constructed from uh, IID Bernoulli random variables. So I will define it on the graph Z2, but it can be defined on, a, on any graph. So you consider Z2 uh, with vertex at Z2 and edges between uh, vertices at distance one of each other. And we uh, fix the parameter P between zero and one, which will represent the porosity of the material. And we will look at all the edges, one after the other, and we will declare an edge to be open, so we will color uh, red in the picture, with probability P and close with probability one minus P. So the first edge is open, the second edge is open, and we repeat the operation independently for all the edges. And what we end up with is a random configuration, a percolation configuration, which is just defined as a set of open edges on the graph. And the terminology open and closed uh, comes from the porosity interpretation. Uh, one can think of edges as pores, and water can flow through an open edge and, she, and it cannot flow through a closed edge. And we denote by P sub P, the law of omega, so the, the random subgraph of the of C. Uh, so by extension to open edges, uh, we define open path, which are just paths made of open edges. So for example, here on the picture, we have an open path from X to Y. And clusters, which are just connected components of the graph uh, omega. So just a cluster is a, is, can be thought as follows. If you inject water at the vertex, the water will uh, invade all the corresponding cluster. And what we are interested in in this, uh, in this uh, model is the emergence of macroscopic, of macroscopic structures. And a natural question, is, uh, is there an infinite cluster on the resulting graph, omega? Of course, the answer depends on the parameter p, 
and it will give rise to a phase transition. When P is equal to zero, there are no open edges, uh, no open edge. So of course, there is no infinite cluster. When P is equal to one, uh, all the edges are open, and there is uh, an infinite cluster, which is the entire lattice. And as P increases, we observe a phase transition as a critical parameter, PC. When P is strictly below PC, all the clusters are finite almost surely. And when P is larger than PC, there is an infinite cluster almost surely. Uh, this phase transition is particularly uh, visible on simulation. So here I represent a 200 by 200 box. And we look at the largest cluster that is colored in red in this box. So when P increases, we have more and more open edges. As long as P is strictly smaller than PC, the largest, the largest cluster of the box here in red is always small. And when we cross PC, so here I just take from P smaller than PC, the largest cluster is small. And when P is get larger than PC, we start to see uh, the giant component and the trace of the infinite cluster to the box appearing. And this cluster gets denser and denser as P increases. In this talk, I will describe more precisely the, what happened exactly at PC, where fractal structures emerge. Uh, nowadays, uh, Bernoulli percolation in uh, 2D is uh, quite well understood. And the recent progress concerns more interactions of the model with other fields. For example, uh, with spin systems, where percolation models, such as FK percolation, can be used to encode uh, the um, information between spins and the correlation between spins. Uh, in the study of a random function, one can construct a percolation model by looking at a random, uh, by looking at level lines of some fields. Uh, in this context, uh, GF, the Gaussian free field percolation or nodal lines play an important role. Finally, in the study of stochastic geometry, which is a study of random patterns in the space, one can obtain percolation model by coloring uh, these patterns, such as, uh, for example, uh, Voronoi percolation is uh, obtained as, uh, by coloring the Poisson-Voronoi uh, tiling of the plane. And all these uh, percolation models, which emerge in, the, uh, in these uh, other fields, they share similar behavior uh, with the Bernoulli percolation, but the study is more delicate due to the appearance of a correlation between different points. And a general challenge would be to build a general theory of percolation, which would apply to a great extent to this large family of models and would bring applications in several fields. Today, I would like to discuss one uh, particular uh, uh, piece of the theory, which is uh, the study of a uh, rousseau semmerwald theory in dimension two. So it was developed in the late 70s by Rousseau, Seymour, and Welsh for Bernoulli percolation. And it gives a very uh, good understanding of the critical clusters. And I will discuss uh, the generalization of the theory to more general model, and in particular, a recent result we obtained last year with Laurin Kolarshin. So in the first part of my talk, I would like to uh, discuss uh, the rousseau semmerwald walsh theory for Bernoulli percolation on Z2. So we just consider the simple model where edges are open with probability one half independently of the other. For this model, uh, we know the critical parameter, and the critical parameter is one half. This is a famous result due to Kesten uh, in the 80s. So when P is strictly smaller than one half, all the clusters are finite. And when P is larger than one half, uh, there is almost surely an infinite connected component. What is special about the value one half? Uh, the answer comes from the planar duality. Let's consider, for example, the following graph that is represented in the, on the slide. Uh, we can associate to this graph a dual graph by associating to all the edges E, uh, orthogonal edges E star. 
So we obtain a graph G star. And here it's, in, it's important to notice that G star is just a, a copy of G, which is just slightly, uh, which is rotated and slightly translated. And the bijection between the, the, the edges of, uh, of G and the edges of G star led to a bijection of the percolation configuration on G uh, to the percolation configuration on G star. We just declare an edge open on G star if it's, if it's a corresponding edge on G is closed and reciprocally. The, the, there is a nice property also which comes from the planar duality, uh, from planar topology, is that here we observe an open path like a path from left to right in the graph G, if and only if there is no top-down path on G star. And this occurs at every scale. This leads to the following relation. Either we have a, like the probability of having a left-right path uh, in, in a, a left-right path in an n by n square, plus the probability to have like a dual top-down crossing in, a, in the same square, sums to one. And it's not. It's nice to observe that when p is equal to one half, the, the red configuration of the picture and the blue configuration, they have the same law. So when p is equal to one half, the two quantities, which sums to one, they're also equal. And therefore, we know that the probability to cross the square should be one half. So this is, uh, this is uh, the, the, the key reason why the critical value can be identified thanks to this kind of self-duality of uh, Bernoulli percolation in dimension two on the square lines. Now we know square crossing, but if we want to describe a bit more the geometry of the, of the clusters, we would like to have like crossing probability for different shapes. For example, what can we say about crossing a two n by n rectangle at criticality when p is equal to one half. And the answer is not uh, rigorously known. It's the object of a conjecture. So if we fix an aspect ratio, lambda larger than one at pc, and we look at the probability to cross a lambda n by n rectangle, then as n goes to infinity, this probability should converge to a limit, f of lambda that depends on the aspect ratio and is given by the so-called Cardis formula. So what is important in this uh, conjecture is at least that this crossing probability, they converge to a non-trivial value. The properties of a uh, Cardis formula are actually uh, uh, stronger than just about concerning only a uh, rectangle crossing. Uh, the model at criticality should have a stronger uh, symmetry, which is a uh, conformal symmetry. If we take a conformal um, image of a rectangle in the plane, and then we kind of rather than looking at rectangle, but maybe more general shape, and we would do the same uh, limit procedure by blowing up uh, our scale, we, we should get the same limit. Another property is the universality. So if we take not only uh, like another percolation model, for example, Bernoulli percolation on the triangular lattice. So we take not the square lattice, but we just change the lattice. We could define the model. At criticality, we should have the same uh, crossing probability in the limit. So the, the, the limit of the model does not depend on the microscopic description of the model. Finally, uh, Last remark is that if we take another model like uh, side percolation on hexagon, so we consider a tiling of the planes by hexagon and we color these hexagons with probability one half red and one half white. Uh, then in this particular case, Cardi's formula was proved by uh, Smirnov and conformal invariance has been established. Uh, Later, based on this, uh, on this result uh, and uh, using a relation to a so-called SLE processes, Loller, Schramm, and Werner could uh, compute critical exponents of the model. For example, they could prove that the probability of having a path from zero to distance n decays polynomially, like n to the minus five over 48, 
as n goes to infinity. So this is serving just a, as a motivation, but my goal today is not to discuss uh, Cardi's formula, but rather um, a weaker version, uh, which is a Rousseau-Semoel theory, and which say that maybe we don't know how to prove the convergence, but at least these crossing probabilities for rectangle, they are non-degenerative. So if I fix an aspect ratio lambda, we can prove that, I mean, they, they could prove that there exists a constant C of lambda positive, such that for every n, the probability to cross a lambda n by n rectangle is larger than C of lambda. So this weaker version uh, of a scale invariance, it says that at all the scale, whatever the scale, you could take, a, let's say, a 3n by n rectangle, you have a positive chance to cross from, uh, from left to right uh, the rectangle. These have uh, several consequences. And it, cannot, uh, it does not imply the, the exact computation of critical exponent, but it gives bound. And it implies, for example, that the the probability that there is a path from zero to distance n decays polynomially fast in n, which is a typical uh, behavior of a fractal uh, um, when, when we observe when we have fractal clusters. It also uh, led to a very deep study of the near critical regime, namely when p is close to pc and was also important uh, in the proof of Smirnov uh, in the case of hexagon, because it provides tightness arguments in the study of the scaling limits. So what I would like to discuss is uh, this, this nice Rousseau-Semmelweil theory and how it extends to other models. Uh, before discussing more general model, I would like to come back on two important properties of, uh, of the Bernoulli percolation measure, P sub P. And the first one uh, is the symmetry property. Namely, the measure P sub P uh, is invariant. So the, 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 the Bernoulli percolation measure is invariant under the symmetries of Z2, translations, reflections, and pi over two rotation. If we take uh, just the percolation configuration that I defined at the beginning of the talk, you can just reflect it or rotate it, then you have the, just the same law. Uh, in the case of Bernoulli percolation, it's a completely uh, direct consequence of the definition. Another important uh, property is uh, positive correlations of uh, crossing events. Namely, if you take two crossing events, let's say, you have a rectangle somewhere in the graph and you have another rectangle at another place, maybe the overlap, then the probability that both rectangles are crossed is larger than the probability that the product of the probabilities that the first rectangle is crossed times the probability that the second rectangle is crossed. These two properties, symmetry and positive correlation of crossings, uh, led already to very very nice relationship between the crossing probabilities. So I will give an example. Let's say you are interested in uh, the existence of a crossing from left to right in a 3n by n rectangle. And what I claim is that we can construct a 3n by n crossing by just using 2n by n crossings. Let's look first at the first, uh, this, uh, 2n by n rectangle on the left. And I ask that there is a left-right crossing. Then let's look at this second rectangle, top-down, and we ask that it is crossed from top to bottom. And finally, we look at the third uh, 2n by n rectangle, and we ask that it's crossed from left to right. If these two crossings hold, what we observe is that the initial rectangle, the first 3n by n rectangle, must be crossed uh, from left to right. And this comes from the fact that in the plane, the three crossings must intersect. But now, like if you remember for Bernoulli percolation, we had an estimate on square. So here I explain if you have already a 2n by n rectangle, you can extend it to a 3n by n. 
But the key difficulty is to extend crossing in square and go to rectangle. And that's the main difficulty in the rousseau semoral theory. So that's what I want to discuss now. Uh, let's say we have an estimate on the crossing probability for squares. And we would like to deduce a crossing probability for, let's say, a 3 n over 2 by n rectangle. We can try to do the same as we did with, uh, with this uh, 2 n by n rectangle in the, uh, like we did before. We can consider two overlapping squares and ask that they are both crossing from left to right. Now these two squares, like these two crossings, they may uh, miss each other. They may not intersect. So what we can do is to consider a third square in the middle and ask that this square is crossed from top to bottom and hope that this top to bottom crossing would uh, glue the two horizontal crossing in order to make a longer rectangle. And then using positive correlation and symmetries, we would get that the longer crossing is larger than uh, uh, C cube, where C was the bound on the probability of crossing a square. And of course, here we cheat, and uh, because the, the main difficulty is to rule out the case where the typically this additional path that goes from top to bottom would always avoid the two horizontal crossing. And even if it's not natural, like uh, morally it should not happen, it's really like the technical difficulty is always to rule out difficult like paths which will always uh, avoid each other. And uh, one can try to build more complex picture, but we, we will always end up with kind of counterexample with very fractal structure that uh, uh, where uh, crossing, long crossing do not hold. So this difficulty was uh, overcome uh, in the argument of rousseau semorel welch by using a clever exploration, which relies on a very specific property of Bernoulli percolation. And for this reason, the, the, the proof uh, stayed very uh, restricted to Bernoulli percolation for many years. In uh, 2006, uh, Bolobash and Jordan uh, invented a very uh, beautiful renormalization argument, which was building on the idea that uh, if the path becomes very tortuous, it becomes very fractal, which would actually contradict the fact that it just has a dimension between one and two. So it was proved by contradiction. Such a tortuous path just cannot exist. And they could prove some kind of a weaker version of rousseau semorel say that, by looking at all the scales together. And uh, recently, like uh, together with uh, Laurin keller schindler we use also a renormalization approach. But we didn't work by contradiction. We said, ah, if the, 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 the path is tortuous, then actually we can use it to glue and create longer crossings. And we obtain a, a new uh, rousseau semorel lemma, uh, which is valid only on the two positive uh, conditions, only on the two hypotheses that P is symmetric and positively correlated. So we just consider a measure P, symmetric and positively correlated, so which includes Bernoulli percolation, FK percolation, and Voronoi percolation that I mentioned in my introduction. And if we have such a, a measure, then uh, an estimate into, from square crossing can be translated into an estimate uh, on a rectangle crossing uniformly in the scale and the measure P. So of course, this was known in previous cases in Bernoulli percolation, which was the original theorem of Rousseau, Seymour, and Welch. In FK percolation, uh, the theory was developed uh, was by uh, Hugo duminil copin and Vincent Befara, where they used some version of rousseau semur welch to, uh, to, to compute the critical value. And later, uh, it was refined by uh, a joint work with Hugo duminil copin and Vladas Sider Abyssus to obtain a, a, a clear description of the critical regime. And for Voronoi percolation, uh, as I mentioned, 
the work of Bolobash and Herdan, and then uh, later on, uh, I obtained a, a very a, a stronger form of Rousse Semorwesh uh, for the model. All these uh, previous proofs were using very specific properties of the model, and uh, the general Rousse Semorwesh lemma that we obtain unify the previous approaches. So now I would like to, to conclude briefly. So what we uh, obtain is a general and a robust uh, Rousseau-Semmerwell theory that led to a um, clear description of critical percolation systems in high generality. Uh, but of course, several uh, perspectives remain. So for example, uh, we expect a Rousseau-Semmerwell theory to hold in specific non-positively correlated model, which is still out of reach, or also when we don't have symmetry. So for example, when we start with a lattice with no symmetry, uh, here even the difficulty is to understand what happened for a square itself. Proving Cardi's formula for specific models. Also getting to understand the concept of universality, so the fact that all the models belong to the same class, and finally, last but not least, maybe developed Rousseau-Semmerwell theory in dimension three. Uh, here, we cannot use, for example, planar topology to force path to intercept. So I would like to uh, uh, finish my talk with uh, just a, a last crossing. And since we are in Geneva, merci beaucoup. Unfortunately, uh, Vincent is not there, but uh, we'll transmit the claps that you produced to him. In any case, we can now proceed. And the second speaker uh, of this uh, afternoon is Chiara Safirio, and she will talk about many body fermion dynamics and the way to the Vlasov equation. Here she is. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, so, I want to start by thanking uh, um, the committee uh, for the prize and the organizer of ICMP for giving me the opportunity of presenting my work. So, what I want to um, the problem I want to look with you today is um, really at the, cross board, at the crossroad between uh, quantum and classical uh, uh, mechanics, and this how to obtain uh, the Vlasov equation, which is a um, classical kinetic equation, very much used in plasma physics and astrophysics, from uh, many interacting fermions. Mathematically, this is modeled by taking uh, the limit for the number of particles going to infinity in a certain regime. And the regime that I'm interested in is the so-called mean field regime. And so this is an approximation that I want to uh, make, approximating the many body dynamics by a one particle uh, effective theory. And I want to do that uh, in order to get a more accurate approximation passing through an intermediate um, effective equation that is called the Artrifoc equation. So for the purpose of this talk, um, I don't know if you see the point there. I will, anyway, I will uh, uh, focus on uh, the uh, horizontal line of this um, graph. And I will just briefly mention at the very end of the talk uh, uh, how to close it uh, with the vertical arrow. So let's start um, more precisely. I want to look at capital N interacting fermions with wave function psi n, which is an antisymmetric uh, square integrable function. So antisymmetric in the exchange of particles. And uh, we can uh, associate to the system an Hamilton operator, which is made of three parts. So the first part is the Laplacian, so the um, kinetic uh, part of the Hamiltonian. The second part is an external potential that is there just to confine my system in a volume of order one. And the last term is the potential, so is a multiplication operator by the 
interacting potential capital V times a coupling constant lambda that I will choose in a moment. So let's do um, a simple counting of the order of magnitude in this um, Hamiltonian. So the contribution given by the potential energy is something that because of the double sum in i and j is of the order n square times the coupling constant lambda, whereas the kinetic energy is of the order five, uh, n to the power 5 over 3. Uh, I will comment on that uh, soon, but I, what I want you to keep in mind for now is that this is very different from what you typically have for bosons or for classical particles, where usually you have something of order n. And why is the kinetic energy uh, much larger? Well, um, here there is a heuristic, so this is a, a picture that was actually pointed out to me by Jackie Chung, who is here in the, in the audience, and I find it very nice. So this is the heuristic, so you have fermions that obey Pauli principles, so they tend to fill in uh, all the ener energy levels, and this is why you have this n to the power 5 or 3. If you want a more uh, analytic uh, um, motivation, then it's a simple exercise to apply lip tilling kinetic inequality to obtain uh, the 5 over 3 exponent. So now what I want to do is to choose the coupling constant in order to balance these two contributions of the energy. And the reason why I want to do that is that I want that both contribution um, survive the limit uh, for n which goes to infinity, okay? So this is easily done by choosing the coupling constant lambda equal to the number of particles to the power minus one over three, where three now is the dimension I'm looking at. So this is not the end of the story though, because uh, um, since the kinetic energy is so high, also the typical velocity per particle is very fast. So if uh, this means that um, we could uh, somehow look at the evolution only for a very short time scale. And this suggests that there is um, a scale separ separation between the wavelength and the length of the observable. So what is uh, kind of natural to do is to rescale time in a semi-classical way in order to catch time scales of order one. And uh, if one does that, uh, one finds that in front of the time derivative of the many body Schrodinger equation, there is an n to the power one over three popping up. So let me now um, just um, call n to the power minus one over three epsilon. So this is a parameter epsilon will, for the rest of the talk, uh, um, satisfy this uh, relation. So it's actually a definition. And let me multiply by epsilon both sides of the many body Schrodinger equation. So what I get is that uh, I find in front of the interaction the one over n, which is typical uh, for mean field in uh, bosons and classical particles. But now this doesn't come uh, alone. It, this is coupled with the epsilon that is in front um, of the um, Laplacian and the time derivative. And this is exactly where usually the Planck constant is. So this means that for fermions, the mean field regime is coupled with a semi-classical uh, scaling. So this is the regime I want to look at, and we are now in the position of looking uh, um, at the limit for the number of particles which are going to infinity. But before doing that, and for reasons that uh, uh, will be clear in a moment. I first want to switch from the many body Schrodinger equation to the von Neumann representation. So let's look at the Liouville von Neumann equation for the density matrix that I will denote by rho n. So this is, um, as you all know, so you have the time derivative on the left hand side of the density matrix, and on the right hand side you have the commutator of the Hamiltonian that I just defined, uh, and in the scaling that I just defined uh, a slide before. Uh, so the commutator with the density matrix. So now in this class of density matrices, there are two class of states. Um, pure states, which are just rank one operators, or operators with rank that are strictly, that is strictly bigger than one. These are called mixed states. 
So these are the two um, class of states, uh, and um, just keep in mind that the, the difference between these two will be uh, useful later on. Um, OK, if I want now to perform the limit for the number of particles going to infinity, I want to define a quantity that is well defined in this limit. And this is uh, um, what is called the one particle reduced density matrix that is obtained by the uh, n particle reduced density matrix just by tracing out capital N minus uh, uh, one particles. So this object here is now well defined and uh, is expected in the limit of n large to converge in some topology to a solution of the time-dependent Hartree-Fock equation that is written here in this um, box. So what is it? On the left-hand side, you have just the time derivative of your now one particle operator rho. And on the left, uh, right-hand side, there is a commutator of this exact same operator that is the unknown of the question with another Hamiltonian, a one particle Hamiltonian that is uh, nonlinear. That's the main difference with respect to before. So um, this is made of three parts. First part is just the kinetic energy. Second part is uh, this uh, uh, operator here that is a multiplication operator that now uh, comes in the form of a convolution of the uh, interacting potential V with a spatial density that is given by the diagonal kernel of the operator rho. And then there is the last term here that is called exchange term and is given um, in terms of its kernel by this um, expression. OK, so um, now the question is, um, or at least the question I'm interested in is, um, so this is uh, um, a convergence that is expected. Is this a rigorous result? Uh, in which topology uh, can we, um, um, so for which interactions, and can we uh, exhibit explicit, ex explicit rates of convergence? So um, here it's what is known, and I actually made uh, um, a selection because there are plenty of results and for time uh, reasons. So I divide the known results into two classes. So in the first class, I put the results without semi-classical scaling. So it's a regime different from the one I'm uh, looking uh, at. And in this um, room, there are, um, or in this conference, at least there are several um, people who, who worked on that. Um, so I see um, Jurt Froelich, uh, Volkerbach, and um, Søren uh, Petrat. So um, in this uh, class of results, then you can uh, obtain very nice results for singular interaction potentials. Um, however, what I'm interested in is when this mean field is coupled with a semi-classical scaling, and in this case, um, so this uh, um, uh, line of research goes back to the pioneering work of Brown and Hepp uh, from the 70s that was for classical particles, uh, and then was um, somehow uh, Narnofer and Sewell and Spohn in the 80s uh, uh, got the weak convergence from fermions to Vlasov for uh, very smooth interaction potentials. So, from the 80s, uh, several uh, progresses have been done, and uh, um, in particular, the work of Elgar, Erdos, Schlein, and Yao, who proved that this um, more refined approximation passing through the Hartree-Fock um, equation. So um, then there have been several results from uh, um, Benedict, Porta, Schlein, and, and several others. So what I can say is that at the moment, we know very well how to treat um, smooth interaction potentials. For long times, uh, with explicit rate of convergence in strong topology. So this is all very nice. But the situation gets uh, way more um, difficult when one wants to look at singular interaction potentials that are, um, I mean, among which, of course, the Coulomb potential is the most interesting one. I also want to mention briefly that there is a, a new um, a line of research proposed quite recently by, by Francois Goltz, Clément Moe, and uh, Thierry Paul, who introduced a, 
um, quantum version of the uh, Monge Kantorovich uh, Wasserstein distance uh, to treat these kind of problems. So uh, let me then state uh, uh, the main result. Uh, and before doing that, I need some notations uh, that are quite easy. So definition of shutter norms, I, I guess you are all uh, familiar with that. Um, if you're not here, you have the definition, or otherwise you just think of them as uh, the quantum uh, contour part of the spaces for functions. And then I want to define some quantum weighted sub -left norms, where the weight is uh, given by uh, one plus the momentum operator to some power. And this uh, quantum sub -left norm are really the contour part of the classical Sobolev norms. And why is that? Because uh, this commutator that you have here with the uh, gradient, this is uh, the quantum contour part of the derivative with respect to the space variable in the classical phase space. And this other commutator here is the quantum contour part of the derivative in the momentum variable. So this is really the quantum analogous of Sobolev um, norms. So with these notations in mind, what we um, proved uh, quite recently with Jackie Chung and Laurent Laflèche is that if you have an inverse power law potential uh, and the solution to the Hartree-Fock equation with an initial data that satisfies some regularity in this sense of quantum uh, Sobolev norms, um, then there exists a certain time interval for which the um, one particle reduced density matrix converges uh, in trace norm uh, to a solution of the r 3 uh, e equation. And we have um, an explicit rate of convergence. So actually, the result is a little bit more, um, more general. Here is like an oversimplified version. We can deal with uh, um, all shutter norms, uh, uh, not only with trace norm, but of course, then the rate of convergence changes accordingly. So um, let me comment briefly. Um, first of all, you see there is a restriction here on the class of inverse power law we can treat. Actually, the same argument can be uh, extended for uh, Coulomb or gravitational potential. Actually, the sign of the interaction doesn't play any role in our analysis. Um, however, we have to introduce an independent cutoff. And this is a little bit artificial. And it's something we are now working on to, to remove. And then uh, the second comment is about this um, assumption here uh, that I think is quite um, crucial to understand the, um, the idea uh, beyond. So this is really a regularity requirement and somehow uh, forces the result to be true for mixed states, so for um, operators or so for density matrices with rank that is strictly bigger than one. Because for pure states, so for rank one projections, we don't have regularity. We cannot ask for regularity. So this is uh, um, the class of states for which these uh, results are all true. And well, uh, the reason, uh, say the oversimplified reason, is that the interaction comes in the form of a convolution in the r fock equation. So you can afford having a singular interaction potential because coming in the form of a convolution, then you can kind of put all the bad things on the diagonal of the operator row. And if the operator row allows you um, to have some regularity, then um, this is, um, I mean, not easily, but it's doable, OK? So let me now give you an idea of the proof and main, uh, so main ideas. So one of the main difficulties is the fact that um, we don't deal with uh, rank one projections. So of course, working with projections is very nice. Uh, but this is not the case for mixed states. But this is a kind of, uh, um, um, so there is a kind of, um, um, how to say, well-known procedure that is called purification. Uh, for, that allows to represent uh, a mixed state uh, as a pure state uh, just on an enlarged uh, space. So instead of looking at the problem on, on the Fox space, you look at the double Fox space. And the good news is that this double Fox space uh, is unitarily equivalent to Fox space uh, on a larger Hilbert space. So 
This allows you to do some uh, algebra and to export techniques that have been developed uh, in, uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so, or even more, uh, for, uh, um, to, to, to mixed states, okay? So then in this enlarged, uh, in this Fox space, on this enlarged Hilbert space, one can represent a mixed state as a vector uh, that is actually a rotation implemented by a Bogolyubov transformation of the vacuum. So we can then define annihilation and creation operator. So you can imagine that there is uh, an algebra that we can develop and, uh, and we can somehow um, uh, extend techniques that, uh, that exist. So here I'm kind of hitting a lot of uh, um, difficulties under the carpet, but this is somehow uh, not the main difficulty in the whole story. So one can prove that the trace norm of the difference of the one particle reduced density matrix and the solution to the r fock equation, they are bounded by the expectation of the number of particles in a state that, is, that represents fluctuations around my original mixed states. And now, I mean, this number of particle operator is the second quantization of the identity, but in this larger um, Hilbert space. So the whole point is uh, uh, to bound this right-hand side, and this can be done by means of a grown wall type inequality. And there are uh, two difficulties. So the first one is that when you take the time derivative of this object on the right-hand side, there are uh, singularity coming from the singular uh, potential, so one has to be very careful with them. And the second difficulty is that there is this uh, um, epsilon here in front of the time derivative, and we really want to catch time scales of order one. So not only we want to deal with the singularity, but also to extract some smallness to cancel this epsilon here in front. So this can be done, and the Gronwall inequality gives the um, rate of convergence. So let me give you an idea on which is the ingredient that save, uh, saves the day. So um, actually when trying to deal with the singularity of the uh, interaction, one really has to extract uh, as much as possible regularity from the diagonal of uh, the operator. And one ends up with uh, bounding uh, objects uh, of this uh, kind. So these are Lebesgue norms, so LP norms of the diagonal of some commutator, absolute value of the commutator of the solution of the r fock equation with a position operator. And let me now do this, uh, uh, seems silly thing of multiplying and divide by epsilon. So if I multiply and divide by epsilon, what I recognize is that what is in here for the reason that I told you before is just the quantum counterpart of um, a derivative in velocity of a function on the classical phase space that I expect to be something of order one. So if I can bound this thing here, then the order that I expect is something of order epsilon that is just enough to cancel, oops, to cancel the epsilon here in front. So then the question is, um, can this object here be bounded? And the answer is yes, by means of some um, adaptation of lip tearing kinetic energy inequality and uh, um, other um, kind of bounds, can be bound by quantum Sobolev norms of this type. And so the final question to conclude the argument is, can this quantity be propagated in time? And the answer is yes, they can be propagated in time uniformly in epsilon for uh, local in time, okay, for a certain time interval. So um, to conclude, then what I show to you is that one can uh, get the horizontal arrow in, uh, in my um, original problem for mixed states for a certain class of inverse power low potential with an explicit rate. And actually, this, as a corollary, we also get the derivation of the Vlasov equation for, uh, for inverse power law um, just by uh, using a previous result that I obtained together with uh, Laurent Laflèche, that is the semi-classical limit from Hartree-Fock to, uh, to Vlasov. So these two results together um, gives the, um, explicit rate of convergence from any body to uh, Vlasov with singular interactions. 
So now let me uh, briefly mention some perspectives. So first of all, it would be very nice to have something that is global in time, and this is really a matter of the propagation of regularity, so it's, a, it's really a PDE problem. And the main difficulty there is to obtain something that is compatible with the, the semi-classical uh, time scaling, so in, uniform in epsilon. And second thing is it would be very nice to remove this uh, independent cutoff for, um, for more singular interaction potentials such as Coulomb or uh, um, gravitational potentials, and this is what we are um, actually working on at the moment. And um, finally, the question is, um, can some of these be extended to the case of pure states. And here, of course, because of this uh, convolution structure, uh, the situation is a bit more delicate because, of course, you cannot ask for regularity in this case. And so maybe um, really new ideas and insights are needed in this case, and it's also possible that the topology we are looking at is a little bit too strong for this kind of, um, of states. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Are there questions or remarks? What do you mean? So the restriction of the potential is coming from the propagation of these properties or from the many body analysis? No, um, this is actually the, the part. So the, the restriction of the time interval comes from the propagation of regularity, but the restriction on the interaction potential comes from uh, the many body dynamics. But I think this can be overcome uh, just by changing the functional setting of the propagation of regularity. Yes, over here, so, uh, do you know what is the growth of your constant uh, CT in yeah. front of your estimate? Double exponential. Okay. This is because of, uh, of ground wall type estimates, yeah. Yes, please. But this result is local in time. So, but for banded potential, I think that's uh, doubled exponential. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, here we have for, uh, for a given time t. So, yeah, that's, that's true. So, let's say I go to the, um, to the theorem. Yeah. So, here, I mean, if you just look at the many body part, this part here would give you uh, an exponential of exponential in time. But since we have propagation of regularity only local in time, uh, in terms of the initial data, then this is, uh, this is not like an RNFS time scale. It's, uh, it's just uh, a local in time result. OK. Are there any more questions? I don't see any. So I believe we can thank Chiara again. Thank you. And we, can, we can pass to the next speaker, Stefanos Aretakis. Once the slides are on. I will start. Okay. Okay. 
So it's uh, my great pleasure to give this talk, and I would like to thank the committee for the honor for awarding the award to me. Um, okay, I would like to talk about a few results for um, the wave propagation on black hole space times. So this is a mathematical work on general relativity. The vast majority of the results that I will mention are joined with uh, Yanis Engelopoulos, who is uh, at Caltech, and Dayan uh, Geitz, who is um, at the University of Cambridge. <coughs> okay, so here's a um, summary of the problem. So the problem is very easy. It's simply the evolution of the linear homogeneous scalar wave equation on the exterior of black hole space times. So the, we consider here the main models of uh, space times that contain black holes. Um, and these two models are the Ryzen Nordstrom family and the Kerr family. The Ryzen Nordstrom family is a solution to the Einstein Maxwell system, and the Kerr family is a solution to the Einstein vacuum system. Um, so here you see the. Um, one second, sorry. How does this work? So this is a black hole region, and we only care about what happens in the exterior, at least in this talk. So we will consider an initial hypersurf. We consider an initial hypersurf of sigma zero. And we consider initial data for the wave equation on that hypersurface. And we want to understand how this data evolve in the future. Um, you don't need to know, um, you don't really need to know, uh, to have prior knowledge of general relativity to follow this uh, lecture. Because I'll simply present results, OK, um, that have to that tell you how, what is the behavior of uh, of the solutions to the wave equation on such backgrounds, on such Lorentzian manifolds. Um, but I will mention a few important aspects, uh, relativistic aspects that are in this picture and are very important for the analysis of our results. Um, the topology of sigma zero is simply the complement of uh, a ball on R3. And then the topology of the domain is uh, sigma zero cross R, okay, which is the exterior region. And the boundary of that domain is H plus, which is the boundary of the black hole, which is our event horizon. And what we want to understand is the um, behavior of uh, solutions, C, um, towards the future, up to and including the event horizon. So we suddenly want to understand what happens along the event horizon. Okay, along this hypersurface here, which is a characteristic uh, hypersurface for the problem. And when I say what, uh, that we want to understand the behavior of psi, I mean we want to understand uh, how psi behaves, like is it bounded, does it decay, does it grow, and also how its higher order derivatives behave towards the future. Future meaning, uh, so this is the, this is the initial hypersurface, when is it? So? Well, I don't know how it works, but uh, future meaning towards the top of the picture. <laughs> now, why would one be interested in studying the uh, wave equation? And the simple answer is because at the end of the day, what one wants to understand is the fully nonlinear Einstein system for gravity. But uh, when you write down the Einstein equations in appropriate gauge, these equations take uh, have a wave form, and the simplest um, case of these equations would correspond to the wave equation. So this is a the problem we will study today. Uh, it's simply a model problem for the Einstein equations. OK, so here is the problem. Um, what the, the goal, the goal is to write Psi um, as a function, as a specific function of time, OK? Like, coefficient times one over tau to the p, tau here is the time parameter, plus something that decays faster, plus an error term. So if we derive such an expression for psi, then uh, the term q times one over t to the p, tau to the p, is simply the top order um, uh, contribution of psi <coughs> in time. So what we want to understand is what p is and what q is, okay? 
we want to find such an expression that gives us the top order uh, asymptotics in time for C. And as we shall see, also would be interesting to derive similar uh, expressions, not, not just for the whole solution Psi, but for specific projections, um, say angular projections of Psi. Now, the main goal of this lecture is to show you that um, one can derive such uh, asymptotics, such expressions for Psi on, on, on curved space times in general, but for the black hole exteriors that we will discuss today also in particular, using uh, physical space techniques, and in particular using a very specific kind of conservation laws. Okay, so I want to convince you that sp specific conservation laws can produce uh, such a, a asymptotics for Psi. Now, why would one be interested in studying asymptotics of the wavy question? Okay, asymptotics uh, have a dual role. Um, they provide both lower and upper bounds, right? Um, and now upper bounds are important for stability considerations, whereas lower bounds are important for the formation of singularities. So, and that specific case would be, for example, studying the strong cosmic censorship. <laughs> okay, so we, the, the trip we will uh, do today is the following. We'll first start with Schwarzschild space times. We'll see what the asymptotics on these space times are. Then we'll move to the charge case, sub extremal rise and Nordstrom. Then we'll consider the extremal rise and Nordstrom. And then we will move to sub extremal care. And then we will see what the asymptotics are on extremal care. OK, I slightly lied here because I say we will start with Schwarzschild, but instead we'll start with something even easier, which is Minkowski. <coughs> So I'll spend one minute here to show you why conservation laws are important to give you asymptotics on Mikowski. So Mikowski will have strong Huggins principle, which basically tells you that you have zero asymptotics. Uh, the solution becomes eventually zero as time flows. And, um, con uh, and this can be immediately derived using conservation law. So here I have projected uh, C to an angular frequency L. And I simply write uh, the equation for that angular projection PCL. So as we can see, the wave equation itself takes the form of a derivative of an expression is equal to 0. So that immediately tells you that the quantity is conserved. So this derivative du is in the u direction that you can see here. So it's the incoming direction. Uh, so that tells us that uh, the, the this expression here is conserved in the incoming direction. So if I consider compactly supported initial data, which are zero in the dotted, um, on the dotted hypersurface, then um, okay, then um, I can consider, so initially they, they are zero where the dots are. Then I can um, derive that they are, conclude that they are also zero in the um, incoming direction. So the solution is expected to be non-trivial in the blue region, but that's not an issue because I can cross this region um, without any issue, and then I can reach the top um, white triangle where the dv derivative of uh, like this expression, oops, sorry. Uh, this, where this expression here um, is also zero, okay? So in the top triangle, uh, this expression is zero, and then integrating in the outgoing direction, one can immediately see that PCL has to be zero. So one can obtain strong on this principle immediately by simply using the wave equation as a conservation law in the incoming direction. And as we will see, this idea will be fundamentally important also for the black hole case. Now, in the black hole case, we have a few differences. First of all, we have an ADMS, which is non-trivial. And we also have other issues which are completely inexistent in the Minkowski case, in the flat case. So we have the presence of a horizon. And um, the horizon comes with its own effects, one of which is a redshift effect. And namely, what you exactly see in the picture, that if you have an observer A, crossing the horizon and um, emitting signals towards the future, then these few signals will reach a future observer B um, uh, in a resifted fashion. Okay, they will be resifted by the time they arrive to B. 
So this is a stabilizing mechanism, and it's super important for understanding uh, aspects of the uh, event horizon geometry. Another uh, issue that is present in the black hole case is the trapping effect, namely the existence of the photon sphere, um, where specifically that means that um, you have null geodesics, which neither cross the horizon, so neither en enter the black hole region, nor go to infinity. So you have null geodesics, which stay in a bounded region uh, uh, in the black hole exterior forever. The, again, this is something completely in existence in the in existence in the flight case where uh, all null geodesics escape to infinity since they are straight lines. And the main issue with these geodesics is that portion of the waves will follow these geodesics for arbitrary long times, which means that portion of the wave will uh, be concentrated in bounded regions for more lo longer and longer times. So that's an issue that needs to be understood before understanding decay properties, the global decay properties. Okay, so wave propagation on black holes has been an intense, um, has been intensively studied in the past 10, 15 years. Um, I list here some contributors. It's almost impossible to list all of them. Um, but one, uh, prob uh, one result I would like to mention is that due to Michal Zafermos, Igor Nyansky, and Jakob Sapenger-Drothman, who have proved that um, um, solutions with appropriately decaying and smooth initial data um, so sufficiently regular, initially sufficiently regular solutions to the wave equation on sub-extremal uh, care uh, decay in time, and all the derivatives decay. So we know that for sub-extremal care and also sub-extremal resonorsum, all solutions and their derivatives decay in time. Okay, now let's uh, consider the first result, which is, uh, again, of the type I I told you in the beginning. So these are the asymptotics of Psi. H is the event horizon. So the first column gives you the, asymp the, the top order um, asymptotic uh, for Psi restricted along the event horizon. The second column gives you the asymptotic of Psi uh, on, on constant radius hypersurfaces. And the third column gives you the asymptotics at infinity. So at infinity, Psi is 0. But if I rescale it with the radius, which is infinite, then I get something that's finite, which is the radiation field. So our psi at uh, infinity is radiation field. And we study the evolution of the radiation field in time. And that has its own asymptotics, which is given by the um, uh, expression here. <clears throat> so what I've listed here is simply the top order asymptotic um, there. So as we can see, if we go in the bounded region of the for the radiation field, just for Psi itself, then we can see that the decay rate, the sharp one, is t to the minus 3. But we also see here that we have the exact uh, contribution, which is minus 8 times a constant, i0,1. That constant will generically be non-zero. So that really gives you non-trivial asymptotics. Um, something else that it's interesting to note here is that that constant appears in uh, the asymptotics of all three cases, so along the event horizon, along constant R hypersurfaces, and of the radiation field at infinity, which means that the asymptotics at, uh, in time at various uh, regions uh, of the space-time are strongly correlated because you have exactly the same constant appearing in front of the time uh, decaying function. Um, and I should mention also that uh, these asymptotics have also been independently obtained by Peter Hinz. OK, so what I would like to spend some more time um, next is to explain a little, a little bit more to you what the meaning of that constant I01 of C is. Because clearly, it's that coefficient that uh, determines the asymptotics. So what is the physical or geometric meaning of the coefficient in the top order asymptotic term? Uh, and not surprisingly, it's exactly what I told you in the beginning, that it comes from a conservation law, OK? So let's see this in more detail. First of all, be before we go into details, let's just see what this uh, coefficient looks like. It's, um, if we consider uh, t equal 0 hypersurface, like a standard hypersurface on these backgrounds, then um, we have an explicit expression in terms of the initial data, which is very easy. It's simply given by the integral of the time derivative and also the integral of uh, 
uh, Psi itself at the boundary of the initial happy surface. So it's a very simple constant that determines our uh, asymptotics in time. Now, surprisingly, the same constant can be understood in terms of the uh, radiation field itself. So if we know the radiation field at all times, okay, this is not about initial data anymore. It's about knowing the radiation field at all times at infinity, at space, uh, at null infinity. Um, and then we integrate that radiation field, then we get exactly the same constant. Okay, so we have two different uh, representations of the constant, either in terms of the initial data or in terms of the global behavior of the radiation field. And this is a slide that explains why that constant is related to conservation laws. So, okay, um, I'll very quickly explain to you what the conservation law is about. Okay. So, if we consider outgoing hypersurfaces, as uh, are the arrows that you I have drawn here, and along each of these outgoing hypersurfaces, I consider the v squared dv derivative of R c. Uh, dv, if you remember, is uh, the outgoing derivative. So I consider the, 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 um, the, the derivatives in the direction of the arrows here. If I take the limit of that rescale derivative, v squared dv, along each of the arrows, and tangential to these arrows, then um, each of these limits gives me a number at uh, what we call null infinity. And now what is uh, interesting is that uh, there is a conservation law at null infinity, which uh, tells me that the limits that I get here, the limit that I get here, the limit that I get here, the limit that I get here are all equal. So there is a conservation law along null infinity. And um, so in other words, the, the limit of v squared dv derivative of our psi is independent on time. It, um, yeah. OK, so the value that I get at null infinity of these uh, outgoing derivatives um, is what we, is known as the newman penrose constant of psi. Now, if I consider compactly supported initial data, then by the domain of dependence property, clearly the newman penrose constant of Psi will be zero because I can simply compute that limit in the region where the solution is identically zero and get that the limit in that region is zero. And by the conservation law, it will be zero along all null infinity. So the newman penrose constant is really zero for compact support initial data, which is exactly what we consider here. OK, so if you have that the quantity is zero and conserved, then OK, it's not super useful to give you, you know, non-trivial bounds, in particular giving, to give you lower bounds. Um, so it's not the new Penrose constant of Psi that appears in the asymptotics. It's not the I0 constant, but it's the I01 constant. And what is this? It's something super easy. It's simply the new Penrose constant of Psi where we have removed one-time derivative. Let's see, somewhere here, I don't know where it's. Anyway, so we take Psi, we remove one time derivative, so we consider the time integral of Psi, and then that solves the wave equation, okay? And so it has its own numa penrose constant, and that numa penrose constant will be generically non-zero. And, that, that, and that's exactly the constant that appears in our asymptotics, okay? This one, this one, and this one, I01. So the asymptotics are, in fact, provided by conservation law at null infinity for the time integral of Psi. Okay. That's all. That's the summary of all the previous slides. Now, what happens to the asymptotics of Psi L? So Psi L, again, is the restriction of uh, Psi on angular frequencies. Again, here I have a table that provides the asymptotics, the precise asymptotics. Um, first observation is that the time decay is much faster. It's 12 plus 3 in just of, instead of just 3, which is for the general case, and L plus 2 for the radiation field. And here we have, again, the precise coefficients that appear in the precise asymptotics. And the main observation is, again, that these coefficients up, um, arise from a specific conservation law, higher order conservation laws with more derivatives. See here, the conservation law is derived with only one derivative. Like if you see I0 of Psi, involves only one dv derivative. Um, but if you want to consider higher angular frequencies and consider the asymptotics of them, 
then you need to consider more outgoing derivatives. Obtain a conservation law and use that conservation law to derive the precise asymptotics of this. Okay, so the, the table here is uh, also known in the physical literature as the Price's Law. Mm, I should also mention uh, that uh, there has been very important mathematical also work in this problem, um, independent of ours. So Doninger, Slang, and Schoffer have provided uh, almost sub-decay rates. And again, Peter Hinz has also derived the sub-decay rates uh, for Price's Law. Okay, so this is again the table that provides asymptotics for Schwarzschild, okay? Now, what, have, what if we consider, so Schwarzschild is the simplest solution, the simplest black hole solution in vacuum, so only the mass M is present um, as a fundamental quantity in this space-time. What if we have also space-time that has charge? And then we would have to move to a Ryzen Nordstrom space-time, and in that case, the asymptotics are exactly the same as before. So here, if you see the, in the title, in the first, not the title, in the first um, sentence of the theorem, we have the wave equation of sub-extrema rise in Nordstrom space-time. And that space-time has mass m and charge e. And the charge does not explicitly appear in the asymptotics. So the expression of the asymptotics is exactly the same, okay, as in the Schwarzschild case, which is chargeless. <laughs> So if we turn on the charge, nothing changes, exactly the same results. And that would seem that, you know, it doesn't matter how much charge you have, the asymptotics are the same. Now, there is a fundamental upper limit um, as to how much charge you can have so that you don't destroy the black hole. The upper limit of how much charge is allowed so that you still have an event horizon corresponds to the extremal case. That's exactly the extremal charge black hole, extremal rise of Nordstrom black hole. <clears throat> So given this table, one could possibly expect that you know, the, the asymptotics are exactly like this, which is exactly like Schwarzschild, uh, even all the way up to the extremal case. Precisely because the charge does not explicitly appear in the asymptotics here. But the charge does appear in the error terms. And the error terms blow up as the charge uh, reaches the, the extremal value. So I'm not going to worry about the error terms, and I'm not going to show you how the error terms look like, but what I'm going to show you is what are the precise asymptotics in the extremal case, where the charge takes its maximum value. So if we consider a solution on a maximally charged uh, black hole space-time, extremal resonance Nordstrom, then these are our new asymptotics, completely different from what we've seen before for Schwarzschild or sub-extremal Ryzen Nordstrom. So first of all, the decay rates are very different. Along the event horizon, uh, the solution simply decays like 1 over t. Okay, It's not even integrable in time. Uh, away from the event horizon, along constant uh, radius hypersurfaces, the decay rate is t to the minus 2. Again, much lower. Even away from the event horizon, uh, much lower than the t to the minus 3 decays, decay in the sub case. Um, and, but the decay of the radiation field is the same. It's t to the minus 2, okay, in both cases. Now, let's consider the coefficients of uh, these asymptotics. Um, in the first two cases, the horizon and the constant radius hypersurface, we have a, com a new coefficient, which is the h of psi. And in the third case, we have the new one for the radiation field. We have h, and we also have the new Penrose uh, coefficient i. So in the extremal case, we have slower decay rates plus a new coefficient. Now, let's see what this coefficient h is and what its meaning. Again, as we'll see, it comes from a conservation law. Before I show you the conservation law, I should mention that the redshift effect that I uh, presented for the sub-extremal case earlier, in fact, it generates in the extremal case, OK? And that's the degenerate redshift effect for extremal black holes. Namely, you start with something, and this almost does not get red shifted. Okay. And this is due to, geometrically, this is due to the fact that surface gravity, a very specific uh, geometric co constant you can define on the event horizon, uh, vanishes in the extremal case. OK, so H. This is the expression that gives us H. Again, H um, is the quantity associated to conservation law. 
So what is the conservation law in this case? It's not a conservation law at infinity, at I plus, but it's a conservation law on the event horizon. We have the event horizon, which is a cylinder. We consider sections of it. Uh, S tau, on each of these sections, we take, um, we integrate psi and a transversal derivative y, like the derivative, the blue derivative here, it's transversal to the horizon. We integrate that over each section, and that integral is independent of which section you chose of the event horizon. So this is clearly a conservation law. It's like a, a sectional conservation law um, along the event horizon. So that constant is a horizon constant, and that's exactly the constant that comes in our asymptotics in the extremal case, okay, in, globally not just for the asymptotics of the event horizon, but even away from the horizon, even at infinity. Okay. <clears throat> so again, we, we see that the, the asymptotics are completely determined by conservation laws. Uh, now, let's consider for a second uh, f um, a physically relevant case, namely a perturbation, a local perturbation of the event horizon, so it's compactly supported, but has the property that this constant is initially non-zero. Then for such perturbations, uh, let's forget for a second the precise asymptotics. Let's just try to understand also how derivatives behave. Um, for such um, initial data, uh, first all the transversal derivatives to the event horizon tend to that constant. So generically will not decay because that constant we said is non-zero. And second order derivatives, um, transversal to the event horizon blow up. Again, this is in stark contrast to the sub-extremal case where, due to the work of Lafermos and Ronyansky and Slapenko and Rothman, um, all these derivatives would decay in the sub, in the sub extremal case. In the extremal case, not only they don't decay, but in fact, higher the derivatives blow up. Now, this is the derivatives of psi that blow up can, in fact, be associated with various physically relevant quantities, such as the energy density measured by incoming observers. So this instability has, in fact, a physical meaning. Um, and it's for this reason, basically, that this instability has been studied by various people, has been also extended uh, in various settings. Um, okay. So this instability that I have mentioned is a stability exactly on the horizon. So there are quantities that grow, higher order derivatives that grow along the event horizon. If you go away from the horizon, these derivatives uh, decay. Okay, so it's a, in, the instability is only seen along the event horizon. And that's why it's called the horizon instability of extrema black holes. Now, what is the source of all these new things? It's that um, conservation law on the event horizon, and in particular, the value of this conservation law, the conserved charge H. So um, this charge is responsible for all these new effects. The charge is defined on the event horizon, but one could naturally ask if it can be determined um, by observers away from the event horizon. If you have an observer away from the event horizon, but that observer happens to be on an extremal rise in Nordstrom space-time, then can this observer um, somehow um, uh, measure the horizon stability from afar? Can, can they measure the value of H? Or is it completely hidden from away observers? The answer is yes. And um, I'll give you here um, um, w one way to do that. So first of all, let's consider um, expression S of Psi. That expression is determined 100% uh, in terms of the radiation field. Uh, at infinity, and specifically in terms of the global integral of the radiation field plus the rescaled limit of the radiation field. So if you know the radiation field at infinity, which is presumably what a far away observer would know, you just know what your behavior is at infinity, um, then you can compute S. Now, if we assume that we are in a charged black hole space-time, specifically the rise of some space-time, then if that space-time is sub-extremal, then necessarily the value of that S is zero. On the other hand, uh, if an observer computes that this value is non-zero, then that observer can conclude that they live, although they are at null infinity, they can conclude that they live in a space-time that contains an extremal black hole. The charge is equal to its maximum value, which happens to be equal to the mass. And in fact, that number that they computed to be non-zero at infinity happens to be exactly the conserved constant at the horizon. 
So that S provides somehow a way to um, measure from uh, afar, you know, whether you have a conserved value or not at the horizon, and hence to determine whether you are um, exim you live in an eczema black hole or not. Okay, so that renders that constant uh, H into a potentially observational signature. Um, and also I have here listed a few other conclusions that one can reach. But let's, due to time pressure, let's skip this. I should also mention that uh, Burko Kana and Subharval um, have also determined the effects of that signature for near extremal black holes, which are even more physically relevant. Uh, and they have found an effect that allows them to somehow um, uh, distinguish between pure subextremality, near extremality, and extremality. Now, we are now uh, entering the last part of the talk. So I'm again reminding you the asymptotics of the Schwarzschild uh, space time. Okay, you see, we go back to the usual decay rates minus three, minus three, minus two. Now, what if we move away from spherical symmetries, but the spherical symmetric space time? What if we want to consider care solutions? These are the asymptotics for care. So go back to Schwarz. Let's go back to Schwarzschild and care. We see the asymptotics are exactly the same. Okay, uh, and again, are given in terms of this constant um, that is defined in terms of the radiation field uh, at infinity. So, uh, in terms of the time integral uh, and its conserved value at infinity. And again, I need to mention that uh, Peter Hinz has derived the same asymptotics using a different approach. Okay, so care is not spherically symmetric, but still we can take a general solution projected on angular frequencies uh, in appropriate sense. These frequencies now will be coupled. Uh, nonetheless, they um, behave differently. Uh, than the general solution. So we'd like to know how angular frequencies of psi behave, even though they are coupled. Um, so here I have only listed uh, the L equal to 1 and the L equal to 2, the first two non-trivial angular modes. <clears throat> and what I'd like to show you is uh, two new effects for angular frequencies on care space times. The first effect has to do with uh, horizon oscillations for L equal to 1. So for L equal to 1, the decay rate is minus 5, which is the same as in the Schwarzschild case. But the coefficient now uh, behaves uh, somewhat differently. And this has to do with the geometry of the event horizon. So in particular, if you follow uh, the null generators of the event horizon, which would be the only causal curves of the event horizon, then along these causal curves uh, along the event horizon, you don't just see 1 over t to the something decay, but you also see time oscillations. So you see oscillations in the um, uh, time evolution of the wave equation, which is, of course, not present at all uh, in, the sub in the spherical symmetric case. Now, the second effect I would like to present is the slowdown of the asymptotics in the L equal to 2 case. So for L equal to 2 in, in the Schwarzschild case, the decay rate would be 2L plus 3, which is 7. But in our case, the decay rate is 5. Uh, so it's, this is significantly lower. And why is it 5? Because that L equal to 2 mode is slowed down by the L equal to 0 mode. And that slowed down can uh, be seen by the coefficient. So the coefficient of t to the minus 5 involves the I0, 1 constant. And the I0, 1 constant is a constant that involves the C0 mode. So due to the mode coupling, um, the asymptotics are um, uh, slower. Slow, slower are slower compared to the Schwarzschild case. OK, so these are the two effects, like oscillations plus uh, mode coupling that are present in the process of deriving prices law for care space times. But it can be done. Um, so the final um, stop would be extremal care. Um, in that case, we can decompose Psi in the azimuthal frequencies. For the zeroth mode, namely axisymmetric solutions, the results are similar to the maximally charged um, uh, black holes that I presented earlier. Extremal care, by the way, simply means that they are maximally rotating black holes. Uh, for fixed azimuthal frequencies, you, you have an amplified instability that has been heuristically understood in physics. And there is a very nice upcoming work by one, 
by one of our collaborators, Diane Guides, who derives these um, um, rates and asymptotics in fact um, rigorously. Um, but what is very interesting is also that the tail, so the, the, the general solution C, in other words, on an extreme care space time, um, we don't know how it behaves in time. Okay, so any result for a general solution on extremal care is open. Not even a basic boundness result, let alone precise asymptotics. But no matter what the precise uh, result is, even though we don't know it at the moment, for sure it's not good. The decay rate will be very, very bad. It, it worse than the t to square root of t decay rate for fixed uh, azimuthal frequencies. So that leads one to believe that in principle um, that very slow decay rate could force uh, perturbations, nonlinear perturbations of extremal care to indeed form naked singularities. But these are all problems for the future. One second, I would like to say that conservation laws are also important in other aspects of um, the wave equation, not just uh, for understanding the asymptotics, but also for understanding uh, uh, characteristic gluings. When you try to, to glue characteristic initial data, um, ca conservation laws are obstructions to such gluings. Um, there has been a complete characterization of this issue for the linear wave equation by some previous work of mine, and uh, recently, uh, with uh, Stefan Cimek and Igor Nyansky, we understood characteristic gluings for the Einstein equations. And again, we saw that conservation laws of the type that I showed you today, but for the Einstein equations, are in fact obstructions to uh, gluing of data along uh, null hypersurfaces. And the, conser the conserved values that, um, are in fact related to fundamental physical quantities, namely mass, linear, angular momentum, and the center of mass. Okay, that's another direction. I just wanted to present it to you. And so again, that conservation laws have other uh, implications. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for a quick, urgent question. Here it is. Take the next mic, maybe. OK. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask, how do your results generalize when, for non-free scalar wave equations when you add a source term? In particular, if the source term is even linear, if you look at Klein-Gordon, and if you add a nonlinear term, um, let's start even with an easy nonlinear term that satisfies the null structure. So what do you get in that case? In these cases, the Klein Gordon and nonlinearity with a nice structure? So we have developed a general method to produce asymptotics. Um, I, th this method, in principle, applies for higher spin equations. Uh, say the Tukolsky equation. Uh, now, if you add uh, you know, other linear terms, in principle, you can destroy the structure of the equation. Um, but um, the method in general tells you, you, know, look, you look for conservation laws at infinity, try to do time integrations, combine these things, and uh, you should be able to get asymptotics. Now, you know, I cannot say it works in all cases. Right? In every case, you have to specifically check if the method works. Um, but uh, what was very important for us was, for example, to understand uh, for angular modes on, um, which are coupled on non-spherical symmetric space times whether this works or not, to apply it for other linear systems such as linearized gravity. Now. It works for certain uh, nonlinear models, okay? So say quasi-linear equations satisfying the null condition, which is a model for the Einstein equations. Um, but apart from that, you know, it's a uh, case by case. You did not study Klein-Gordon? In this work, no. Okay. I mean, Klein-Gordon uh, has fundamentally new difficulties and different behavior on black hole space times. So you do not know. Uh -huh. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh -huh. yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's about time to close this section. Uh, I think we should thank Stephanos again. And thank and congratulate again all our speakers of this afternoon.